Do it. Do the clap. Do the clap. Did it. Clap a trap. We're on track. Oh, that's right. We're on little. Welcome track. to Up to Date Cinephile. I'm your host Ben. This is Kyle. We talk about movies. We do. Kyle's playing nerdy Dungeons and Dragons later, so we're gonna have a so much shorter <laughs> episode. It's but not technically maybe... Dungeons and Dragons. It's like it's themed like that. It's a you. Ro- it's our dice rolling. Play, a character playing kind doing, of game. Doing one that's like somewhat something that someone made up is more nerdy. Yeah, I suppose that's, that's true. More nerdy. <laughs> Somebody did create this. So. That's way more nerdy. I've done all these things. Like I'm I just going Sunday off night. for the I, I, I'll play. I, I, my game's tonight. Actually, I'll play tonight at seven. Oh really? So I'm a nerd. I'm not. When I say nerdy, I'm just. That's just an. Observation. It's just an observation, not, not a judgment. judgment. Okay. Not a judgment. All right. Well, we're uh, I'm yeah. Gonna finish up my cutie on camera too. Well, maybe I'll take that time to. Uh, you want to have one? Yeah, I might as well. Yeah. So we're talking about two movies. X. Which is not about the X-Men. Or the X Factor. Or X-Files or being D- straight edge. Or D-Generation X from like wrestling. or yeah. No. I'll do a crotch shot for you anytime you want. <laughs> no, it's just uh, X. Another one. New, new film from Ty West. He's a young horror auteur. He's done like The Sacrament and uh, oh, the... Uh, the violent eh, something I forget. It's a, yeah no it's a long <laughs> title I, I forget it it was one he did after the sacrament but he's most known for doing that took a kind of six year absence and now he's uh returned so you gotta let it percolate yeah you gotta let it uh yeah you gotta let it uh yeah percolate's good r- r- you know ruminate and contemplate we and spoilers we will do spoilers yeah, we just openly, I mean, Up to Date Cinephile is really about you coming in and having seen the film, really. Or if, if you're or not, you or you shit. just don't give a shit. You yeah, just don't give a shit. We, we, that's, that's, our, that's our wheelhouse, is people who've seen the movies or people who just do not care. So if you don't fit in one of those categories, this might not be for you. And if might you, not. You'll be upset if you have these movies spoiled. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which I guess, I don't know. Maybe maybe one of them is a little bit more spoilable than the other. The second movie we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, that that has a lot of twists and turns. That, uh, but for me, we're predictable, so we can. <laughs> maybe we can't spoil either of them. But I don't think X would. Uh, well, actually, no. I, I let, well, let's start with X. I, I do think. I mean, ultimately, that there is carnage, and who survives is not particularly surprising. No, I it it. But, it, but the way it unfolds, I actually. I mean, the movie presents you, you know a bunch of people are going to get murked. You know yes. that from the very beginning, because the opening scene is the classic, you know, after everything has happened, the sheriff shows up with the kind of like, oh, what the fuck is this kind of energy? What is happening? <laughs> what is happening? It, and, and so... It almost felt like that could have been Danny Glover being like, I'm too old for this shit. Yeah, there's heavy <laughs> Danny Glover energy. But... Uh, the movie, as it goes on, presents you with several different ways or several different candidates right for who you think is go- what you think is going to happen i will say that the way it ultimately unfolds was kind of interesting to me it, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily what i imagined it was it was kind of the way they the sort of the particular permutation well, of why these killings were happening i do have to say so what i'm most impressed about x which is is could be categorized as run of the mill slasher. I don't think it's that. I think it's a little elevated. Uh, you know, it, it has that additional kind of technicality, uh, style, this kind of atmospheric approach, these elongated, patient uh, sequences that uh, do give it the kind of elevation above its kind of strict, uh, you know. Teen, you know, teenage or or sexual people getting just ousted by the blade. You know, just getting go- yeah, gorged. Yeah, a v- v- lot of sex. I'd say for this, even for a horror movie, a lot of nudity. Well, it's lot, porn. Like it's a lot it, of sex. They're going to make a porn. I was movie. wondering if they were going to show actual penetration. I was like, whoa, is this going to? Where we go all the way? But you probably need to be NC seventeen. That would be a NC seventeen. If, you, if you're going to show actual. You don't even really. I, I feel like it's bad because for the ladies, because you don't really get any dick. You get some man ass. You do. And you get like the silhouette of a dick. You do get a silhouette, of which a dick. you know may or may not be real, right? But but uh, you you know, I feel like they could have been a little more Im- impressive if time. it is impressive oh, yeah, if it's no, real. No, no. <laughs> it's a, it, yes, indeed. But um, yeah, I would say it's elevated. I mean, we've had this conversation a million times. I'll recap for people. I say. 
I'm not really into horror. Kyle, you're more of a horror, horror guy. Kyle says, I'm really not as much of a horror guy as you nah. think, given the kind of t-shirts I wear. And I say, yeah. that's true, but you still have seen a lot more horror. I mean, you've seen a lot more movies, period, than me, but you've seen a lot more horror movies. Sure. You're certainly more aware of it as a genre. I'll say that I enjoyed this movie. I thought it was fun. I thought the one, the one thing that I was I thought the movie did really well, which I think made it effective and made the setup effective, is you know, you've got kind of the movie before the horror starts. Yeah. And the movie did a surprisingly good job of getting me like caring about and invested in and interested in these characters and interested in the kind of hypothetical movie this could have been if it weren't a horror movie. Yeah. Like I would have think this would have been a fun movie to watch if they had just gone there and made the porno. Yeah. Right, and it didn't have this whole horror thing. Well, so and, I so I thought that was very effective yeah. because I was I was into the characters. Um, there's kind of a good group scene where they sort of have a a believable but kind of interesting debate about sex and kind of sexuality. Yeah, uh, and one of the characters um, who had been timid up to that point and been sort of like the boom operator decides that she wants to do a sex scene in the movie, which kind of drives kind of is the incident that then drives us into the the horror movie portion and also yeah. kind of the yeah. the presentation of a kind of her boyfriend is sort of for a moment you think oh well maybe these crazy freaky looking old people don't have anything to do with the killing so they, da- they dangle that for a minute i thought fairly effectively like well, and i thought that that was a good red herring well you know? i i think where it's ingenious quality lays and and this idea of character i think is very important because how, how they lay the groundwork because even in the the movies that it pays homage to mainly texas chainsaw massacre that movie doesn't take a lot of time getting into the characters or their dynamics or who, who what guides them professionally, personally, uh, psychologically. And this movie does take its time. I mean, you're in that van and you get you get an exposure to... It's, it's what, quite a while before the killing starts, oh, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, Longer it, than I expected it to be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they really, ru- you know, ruminate and let it breathe. And uh, characterization-wise, it... That's where the ingenious part comes in because uh, a lot of these movies are about how younger people go out and they're in, uninhibited and they have sex and then they get killed. And this movie is about people who are overtly already already having sex. And the instigation happens when the, where, where the guy who's trying to make... He's, he's like saying, oh, it's like a Godard film. He's yeah. trying to have this affluent, <laughs> pretentious look at, at making porn into an art form. He wants to make what he calls a good, dirty movie. Yeah, good, dirty movie. It's possible, he says. It's all possible. It's possible. How, how many have tried. And uh, w- w- the he is the character who is presented with a bohemian conundrum it's it's he's the one who reacts in his reactionary attitude is against free love or the free openness well, but it's also and, against his his stated views right because absolutely his his girlfriend undergoes this transition from you know being sort of seeming prudish about it to being into it and wanting to well, have, do also a scene. also essentially just his right hand woman like his his girlfriend sound operator the, she is doing things for him it is his vision it's his film and she's helping him do his presentation his reaction to her wanting something for herself sparks everything and, and so it's his denial of sex or his denial of its its presence his denial of uh her being free with her own form of expression is is it, it usually it's about sex invites the killer in Halloween, uh, Friday the Thirteenth, but it, it in here it, it is the denial of it yeah. that spawns everything and so it's it's kind of this twist on and and an overt acknowledgement of what guides the kind of slasher in its history the slasher is an interesting creation because even though it 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 is bred out of exploitation it is almost the opposite it's it's the opposite vengeful yeah violent reaction towards sex yeah, that but, that yeah. that breeded it yeah and that i guess is what was surprising to me yeah how the way it unfolded like ironically enough of all the characters in this movie right where so we have the older couple the two the two homeowners and then the group of people who are there to make the porno the younger people he's the only sex negative one 
Yes. Which is a big surprise. I thought it was a big surprise. Because you're set up to think... First, that like... Like, uh, incidentally, by the way, just to, just as an aside, the most the most intentionally hideous looking old people oh, yes. ever put on screen. Yes, and indeed that I've well, ever one, seen. One Stephen Yuri and, my, and, my, and the other is Mia Goth, who plays Maxine as well. She it's just her yeah, in old makeup. It's just it's just like my mom works at a nursing home. I've spent plenty of time there. I've never seen old people that look this decrepit. <laughs> Uh, the 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 old man makes the crypt keeper look spry. He's like a scarier version of the crypt keeper. He looks like Riff Raff from Rocky Horror Picture Show, grown up uh, mm-hmm. and uh, has lived out his life, and he just doesn't want to even remotely go back to and that his, past. And his wife looks even worse. She's even more <laughs> frightening looking. It's a ama- it's very it is horrific, right? Yeah, and. I so I expected well maybe first so you start thinking I mean obviously you're set up to think that the bad guy is the is the husband yeah he's the scary creepy old guy and yeah, he comes cocked and loaded with a shotgun yeah and then um, maybe um, the, oh maybe it's really the the cameraman who was all for free love until you know he actually had some skin in the game and. Then you find out that it's actually it's sort of an interesting permutation. That, yeah. That he, the, the husband feels guilty because he has a bad heart. He can't please his wife. She's still extremely horny at the advanced age of 130, I think is probably how old she is. <laughs> and this is all, he wants to help her get her rocks off. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And if sex negative cameraman had been willing to just bone her in the driveway... Maybe a bunch of lives could have been saved. Well, that's interesting because they they allude to something a little darker, a little more insidious that they're that, that they're they, they are capturing people. Like you know, you get the the yes. un, underneath the yeah. This isn't the first time they've done this. No, no, and it, you know that is strongly suggested. Yeah, and so it, it yes, it 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 has this idea that perhaps if he just went along with it if he wasn't yeah, so exactly. but i i don't know i i feel like these two are obviously very very demented that they, they there is this interesting I mean, they've lived too long that no human should live as long as they yeah. live you cannot expect their brains to it, function and it is so interesting how they play off i mean there's there's a, a lot of a lot of things going on with the presentation of the old especially the fact that mia goth plays both the young plays maxine the sex symbol she's like i'm a goddamn sex symbol is how she declares herself she she knows she's special once everyone sees what she's able to do they know she's special and her her essentially older mirrored version her her dorian gray (laughs) pearl this woman who used to be a dancer used to be a beauty and pines for her younger sexual self, her younger sexual... Or at least to get it on with her decrepit husband. Oh, yeah, just something, you know, just she's, to... She's horny. She's she horny is. for it. It th- There's something going on there. It's almost like the, the movie is mocking the very notion of the idea and putting it into a very explicit visual form that these things, such as sex, drugs, enjoyment, are only for the youth it's only for youth we we talk about these things in our older age about how these were like kind of the prime essence of our life to to visualize and practice in that way and here you have this older woman who has the yearning like a such a yearning that it comes off murderous that uh that that they're they're mocking this idea that it's only for the youth and yet also sh- you know the the most off-putting sex scene in the movie is not with the young people who you are probably titillated by but with when they the old couple finally does start screwing it's awkward it's weird it's oh yeah strange. the energy in the theater was was very interesting yeah this is definitely a movie that seeing like i saw it i mean it wasn't a packed theater but there were plenty of people in yeah, there mine, mine as well and it was definitely interesting because i was with someone and she was just like horrified by this some people <laughs> were laughing i found it funny I found some it funny. people were like you could tell but i thought that was very effective because yes the movie is kind of playing around a lot with the idea of what is or isn't taboo yeah yes right because yes they're doing something that in theory 
especially for the time that it was done in, was taboo, right? Yes. You know, the movie sort of mentions that this is kind of at the front end of home video. This idea that, okay, we're going to make porn for home video so you don't have to go to a public theater and, you know. That's how it was. Do what yeah. you do, right? You can do it in the privacy of your own home, right? So this they're right on the cusp of that. So in, they're in Texas, right? And they're worried, so worried about finding out that they leave the city, right? Because, you know, whereas now the thought of like, any city in America, people giving a shit if you were making a porno in it, it's hard to imagine. Yeah, yeah. Right, but there it's like, oh, well, what if people find out, so we'll go out to the country where it's more conservative, but we can be more secluded, right? And so th they're doing this thing that is ostensibly taboo, but now, of course, watching naked people cavort is just like everyone with an internet connection has done that. And then it's like, well, what are you really going to respond to? Well, old people fucking, especially like really old scary looking people fucking well that's kind of taboo now it is but it's a weird because it's not a it's a weird kind of ta it's i wouldn't even call it a taboo we're just disgusted by it yeah no i don't think anybody thinks it's morally wrong right no it's not like it's just know, unpleasant sex with someone who's young too young yeah it's just it's just it doesn't work like it just it sets off our disgust it's a lot of people don't want to think about that kind of, and that's actually kind of what where i the movie won me over a lot of the way in a lot of ways because uh, well, characterization was good. I liked the br the the breathing elements where where there was a lot of good repartee between the yeah. characters. A lot, they, it, yeah. They got a lot out of not much. Like yeah. in, in a relatively short amount of time, they were able to create this ensemble that were interesting and funny, and each character had at least kind of a couple them like. It was at least two dimensional. Ironically, the Matthew McConaughey impersonator was the mo most one dimensional character. Yeah, Martin Henderson as Wayne. Although I thought that was again, I liked that this movie had a really good sense of humor, and Martin is, is like kind of an embodiment. Of oh, that. he's funny, but yeah. he's more one note. Whereas yes. the rest of them have at least kind of like two note. I'm just saying, I thought it was a very like I thought the first part of this movie before the violence starts is a pretty good case study in how. You could take an ensemble in a relatively short amount of time and really make it work. Like they have, a, they have a good dynamic. They have a good conversation, like I said, where the characters kind of open up a little bit. And it's like, okay, they do have kind of complex and interesting views about sexuality. And they do have kind of be a believable attitude about sex work and about what they're doing yeah. and what it amounts to. And, you know, especially for some of the characters, like the other woman who's involved, who kind of is like the classic, like, blonde, you know, bimbo or whatever. Yeah, that's pretty so. She, she turns out to be, like, a more interesting and somewhat more, she has sort of an interesting kind of more complex worldview. And so I just thought that, that the first part of it was a, was a real case study in, like, doing that very, in a way that is entertaining and economical and and moves along and is fun to watch partially because yeah. it's just sex but partially because yeah it's it's i just thought to me that was that was novel yeah. right that was sort of a not i mean i'm not saying that it's never been done but i thought wow i like i said i would watch the rest of this movie just to see these characters and to see and what happens. them making a porno yeah. play out yeah yeah, because which, which makes the ultimate violence more impactful, right? Because you have absolutely. some affection for these. You characters. do, you do, because they are all charming in their own ways. Whether it is RJ, you know, in his artistic ignorance, whether it is, um, you know, Kid Cudi plays uh, Jackson, and you know, you have this like black exploitation kind of character coming on, you know, in in a sex like a very very. I think stereotypical, but then you, it's layered. He was he was a veteran, and he has all all a kind of he has kind of an affection for his scene partner that is deeper than you would imagine that someone in that that uh, that profession to have. And so, and he's the one who gets killed for being a good dude. I mean, he's more than anyone. I know it's he, so tragic. Yeah, he, he gets super killed sad. for doing basically, you know, being con to help. Uh, the husband looked for his wife. Yeah, which she is, 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 yeah, it's just yeah, a, he, a ploy. He's, the, he's the, that's like the most noble thing anyone does in the movie. Yeah, yeah. It's, it is interesting to see all these characters intertwine, react, and put them in a hot van 
with, with one clear purpose. They all have the same purpose, and they're all approaching it from very different ways. And uh, in, that's all you need to articulate interesting, unique, and believable characters. And because of that, the violence that unfolds is certainly thrilling is a word that would probably be used but for me it becomes i i a blend of tragic or it's funny it's humorous because there were i think ty west is having a good laugh at oh, our, yeah, there's definitely a lot of winking oh yeah there's a huge amount of self-awareness involved in this movie that i was w- wildly impressed with that it's that self-awareness and and that confidence he has a confidence and how he elicits terror but also humor which which uh, have have always kind of been entwined together you know it's 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 about ratcheting up a a, a reaction to things and and terror and and having that that tension in a scene i think ma- there's a masterful stroke of genius in this movie and it's actually the best sequence of terror is when Mia Goth's Maxine goes into the water and the camera slowly pans over to a ga- an alligator in the water. And then you have this omniscient, godlike view of this that, alligator. That was great. It's that was a great piece stunning, of Stunning, stunning piece of work. Uh, and it, it doesn't get better than that, but that's not to take away from what is a, a competent rendition on the familiar of the slasher by also integrating a lot of interesting ideas of about where the characters go how what their fates in, in entwine with each other and then a kind of kind of campy yeah. you know immersion into humor that I, I i found to be quite successful yeah i like i think the word you use confident is really good word to yeah. describe this movie this movie i think yeah i think it's really good i, mean, I don't think it has a false note i don't think it drags mm-hmm. at any point i think it's a movie that's clearly like it's not a movie that's like stuck between a bunch of different ideas. Like I no, mean, I, I I know I come I've come back to it a few times, but like one of the horror movies we did last season was Antlers, which was just a classic example of a movie that was stuck between like too, way too many ideas and not doing any of about them correct, what it was yeah. trying to say or what it was about. Right, this is a movie that knows exactly what it is and does it in a way that is sort of artful and interesting. Has some novelty, has some humor. And um, it looks good, right? It's just an attractive movie. Yeah. It does, like, the trick of having the the porno scenes, like, shot from the POV of the camera, which I liked. I mean, sometimes that stuff doesn't work for me, but in this case, I thought it was cool. Well, yeah, and, it was and, cool. and then, you know, it's, it. we're at the cusp of, as you said, like, the, you know, porn for the video market. But 1979 is kind of a culmination of what an end of an era that was defined by its exploitation of violence in one realm and the emergence of porn and the exploitation of porn. I mean, this is, I, I think I, I called it Texas Boogie Nights Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, um, and, and, and and it has, the, it, it's an interesting splice, a synthesis of these two realms that, again, we're all always informed by each other, but for this one, it seems to empower both at the same time. Because it is kind of the synthesis of that decade. And it's going into, obviously, we're going to change once 1980 uh, comes around. Porn changes, cinema changes in, in a different way. But 1979 is an interesting choice. Porn is so interesting, right? Because <laughs> I was talking to a professor a long time ago. He was just talking about like the, the things, the sort of debates that have, like the way that debate in the classroom has evolved. Where when he was in school, like, porn was just a huge topic. Like, yeah. people would just fight about it. And now it's like nobody cares. It's just so normalized. Everyone's yeah. seen porn. I mean, even I'm even, yeah, I'm, I always talk about how old I am. I mean, I remember, like, uh, my friend having a VHS tape and us watching it together when we were teenagers. Like, I mean, so, like, the time when this shit was, like, hard to find and it wasn't ubiquitous and it didn't, couldn't just come through the internet, right? But, I mean, if you think about... Like porn, marijuana. I mean, there's just a few things that are gay, gay, you know, and sort of different sexual preferences in our lifetimes. There's just been since from when this movie was made, which is you know, or when the, the period it, it depicts, which is two years before I was born to now. One of the probably one of the most dramatic. Oh yeah. Changes. 
Yeah, and, well, and, his accessibility and opinion it, towards it. And we're oh, and because of that rapid accessibility, that change of opinion, we're almost kind of seeing a counter shift against it. <laughs> like you know about what it does to the brain. Oh what yeah, it does no, there, to... there's definitely a backlash. Uh, which I and, think it, is and it's not prudish. But... It's all based off of you know balance and health and and yeah. how, how do you approach these well, now, things with a modicum we've got of generations sense. coming of age that grew up with this shit yeah which is like thankfully not my case like i said like i couldn't like one thing you, I, one thing that i i think about i'm sure i'm not the only one when you watch a movie like this is like how titillating this movie would have been to a younger me oh yeah versus Absolutely. how kind of it was like i mean these are attractive people getting naked so i you know that's always nice but like it wasn't like oh my god like teenage me would have you know, it would have been I would not have been, and you know I would have I would have had to take a you know thinking back on it there's not that much of it you know it, it's there's there's uh, one very explicit sequence and then there's one that is uh, alluded to but kind of you know because of the horror of it it's it's done through kind of the reflection of the 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 lens which I, I found to be. You know, because of the the filmmaker and it, what, what his attention and what he's seeing through that lens, I thought that was a, an articulation. You know, a technique that uh, shows what's happening in the scene. It, it, it's not about even though there's sex, there's not. It's not about that. Even though there's violence, it's not about that. It's it's how these characters react to their situations, and how you know it, they're at the disservice of not being informed. In 1979, about a, a, a swath of films that Scream would then make a rule set, and now everybody has to be aware. Everyone's aware of how horror movies operate, and so this is kind of taking it back, you know, taking it to a period where it wasn't informed by this, and and making it just pure and what horror was about, you know, utilizing people's kindness against them utilizing people's ego against them utilizing people's uh you know fascination with or or, or apprehension with sex and with things that are taboo during that time you have that's why it's a period piece you have to take it back in order for it to really feel of its time but also to rearticulate why it was fascinating in the first place and Absolutely. so i i was i was impressed by this movie yeah. I mean, there, there are, and, and there definitely are some real flourishes, right? You mentioned the best, which is the alligator scene. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, the scene of the first killing, right? Like the way that they shoot it and light it with her hair kind of looking like a halo from the yeah, distance. Yeah, I was really impressed with some of those. I mean, the, the movie definitely know, knows when to do like a flourish or to kind of go from like the up close and disgusting to, to come pull back and be a little more artistic with it. It just had a nice flow in that way. There was that, a, that is that I thought was engaging and yeah. showed some real cinematic chops over and above just kind of the obvious shots of you know people getting stabbed yeah. or whatever. I would have to watch it again to really study. There's an interesting thing he does in the edit where he does these repetitious cutbacks. Where after the sermon of the man, who you later find out is I guess Mia Goth's father. Um, yeah, that's like the final reveal. The final I reveal. Was, I, I thought that was one thing I felt kind of was kind of neither here nor there. It do, it doesn't necessarily matter. I mean, it is. I, mean, I guess you're sort of closing a loop. I you're clo What you're essentially saying, and I I think I get it, is that the people who are constantly peddling, moralizing, and they're proselytizing in this way, and it's the undercurrent of the American culture. You push people into the kind of extreme. I think she is an, she is an extreme, and she's the hero at, at the same time for a reason. She's an extreme because the culture demands someone to re be a reactionary, a rebel against these conventions. Because the conventions are what pushing it in the yeah. first place. Well, it also adds depth to her repeated line about deserving a life yes. that better than the one she was given. Absolutely. Like, it's clear that that is really... Because at first you just think she's some sort of bumpkin. What you realize is she was born into some tremendously restrictive circumstance. Yeah, restrictive. Yeah. And so her life is being lived kind of in rebellion against a very some sort of extreme form of fundamentalist yeah. Christianity. Yeah. And so I, I think it, even though it's 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 supposed, to, I don't know if it's supposed to be shocky, but but it, what's interesting is he does these edits where he'll finish the sermon, and they'll cut back to the shop, then cut to him, then cut back to the shop, then cut to him. And they do. They they also have these strange uh, and and clever uses of edit where 
uh, Wayne gets stabbed in the eye and then they cut away from it and then they shock you back into that moment where now it's being pulled. The, the needle or whatever, is, uh, I guess it's pitchfork, is getting yeah. uh, pulled right back out, out. They pull your eyes back. Back yeah. in, yeah, the, it literally, quite literally. And so I was impressed by how these are just little decisions in in choice of edit or framing and how you experience them and he he jostles you he he yeah. takes you out of your comfort zone with what you expect it's like i expected him to get stabbed in the eye i did not expect to come back yeah. to it r- when, once it has been left well, and, and once again it adds that wrinkle that's a little unconventional and yeah. that's a little unexpected right to because you know a bunch of these people are going to get killed absolutely I mean, that's, that you know and so he, I, I do like there's an aware, that awareness, that confidence. It allows him to breathe a new sense of creativity in what is very familiar. I mean, you described that if you you had a synopsis like uh, some people wanting to make a porn film go to the, the middle of nowhere Texas to film it, and violence ensues. Start getting picked off. Yeah. Yeah. It's. I mean, you've seen that movie a thousand times before. How do you do something that's familiar but breathe a new sense of confidence and creativity to it? You you do what Ty West. Yeah, here. yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think I think bottom line, I think people. Yeah, if if you think this movie's for you, you'll probably enjoy it. Yeah, this it's this not is... really my kind of a movie. I like you know back to the horror thing, but I enjoyed it. I yeah. I, you know, I mean, it, it was a normal level of anxiety producing uh, for horror movies as they as they go for me. But uh, yeah, I, th- I, th- I think we both are probably in the like would recommend category. I would. I, I, it is definitely worth your while. Yeah. I, I think it's inventive enough. I think it's stylish enough. I think it, all the performers are very good. I, th- I was very and, I've always been impressed by Mia Goth and yeah. uh, she, she continues to impress me. Yeah. Um, and and I, I do think it is worth seeing in the theater, too, because I think especially if there are yes, people there. Yeah. See, hearing their different experience of it and being in the room to feel kind of how the oxygen is when certain things happen, especially involving older people and fucking that added to the experience for me. Cause I thought that the, the polarizing nature of those scenes was I like really, that. Yes. was really brought out by, yeah. you know, having my, my friend kind of like looking away and retching and then having other people kind of titter. And it, <laughs> it was, it was just a good, it was a reminder of what's nice about seeing a movie in theater with other yes, people. Yeah. And getting, and getting the widespread, the varying reactions. As opposed to, and here's a little segue to the outfit before that movie started, I thought I was going to have, I, I like to sit a little closer than most people. Me too. Yeah. And uh, so I was in the third row. I, I like, so you were talking about AMC. Yeah. Third row AMC would be ideal. I, I realized this the other day when I went to see the outfit. I was like, I should be in the third row. Yeah. Like, because I was the person at Arclight, which had some space. I sat in the front row. Yeah. Sat in the front like the row. Loved it. Row loved it. Yeah. yeah. So, so I agree with you. So the the uh, so I thought I was in the row myself, and then someone shows up. There, it's an older couple, and they proceed to first disinfect. Well, the, she disinfects not just her seat, but I would say six seats. Seven wow. seats, Jesus, which shows both a weird paranoia and also, quite frankly, a misunderstanding of how COVID works. Yeah, because yeah, it's airborne; it doesn't just like sit on the chair. <laughs> but she's like right with these chairs down to the point that I think a, for about half an hour, the spell of like wipes just lingered over us. Uh, and then they proceeded to like basically bust out like a Chinese takeout meal <laughs> and start oh, like, "Come on." <laughs> The worst. Yeah, I guess maybe that's part of why they wanted to clean it up because you know you don't want to you don't want to eat in a dirty place. No, I suppose um, not. But if they came in like halfway through the trailers, and she just she comes out with a wipe and she starts wiping. I'm like, okay, that's, I don't think that's gonna help you. But and then she just keeps wiping and wiping and wiping. I was like, is she gonna be still wiping when the? I mean, thankfully it's AMC, right? So she had another ten minutes. Yeah, to... she had she had a decent amount of time. But it was uh, I I'd not seen anyone uh, operate on her level of disinfectant. I'm surprised she was sorry, out of the house. Was, I, I don't. I, were you ready to transition? Yeah, I yeah, just, yeah. No. I just wanted to tell I, my I, story I think, about theater experience. I, I think we recommend X. Um, we have divisive opinions about the next one. Well, I'm so I'm interested to hear your because I, I I mean, I said I liked this the outfit. You said you hated it. I hate it. You're, you're. I will say that I can tell already that your intensity of response is going to be higher than mine. Yeah, probably. Setting aside the quality of the response, yeah, because I did not <laughs> love this movie. No, no, I'm sure not. 
Um, but I found it to be mostly entertaining with some caveats. So, so why don't you just tell me why you hated it? Okay. Uh, I, that'll be more interesting than what I, I hate thrillers like this. And what I mean by this is that they are so ingrained in their sense of cleverness that they overwrite themselves. This script is const is constantly <laughs> overwritten. Okay, I see where you go. It is it's it's prescribing everything to a T to the point where it's illogical to me. Where scenes happen where I'm like that scene didn't need to happen. The only reason it happened is so you could explain to me the audience why the wh- what's kind of going on in the background. Particularly, there's a scene where the the, the secretary is played by Zoe Deutsch. She's dating a gangster played by Dylan O'Brien named Richie. They are dating secretly. The, like all, all you needed was the small little look that Mark Rylance's character, Leonard, who is who is the tailor. She works in his post. The tailor of Panama. The, the tailor of Panama. <laughs> yeah. And it's his shop. All these gangsters kind of use it as a backroom drop. You know, he he is kind of he he is the tailor for the Chicago gangster of the area, and Irish gangsters. Irish happy, gangsters. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, yeah. Roy, Roy is the name of the character. Irish mafia in Chicago. And what ends up happening is that she has like a little glance when Rich, when uh, yeah, when Richie's at the shop, and Mark Rylance is, starts you know saying something like hey maybe you should uh see this guy he's the clock clock workers assistant the and then and she's like <laughs> she's trying to set him up with some nerd and and and, and, and she's like, i don't like nerds there's like two boys. yeah there's two examples here one they overwrite her reaction she like over explains like her thought fa- like her relationship to her father she over explains that oh she's like oh you saw me giving him a look so that's why you want me to do this i'm like guys you do not have to explain these things we are an audience. We are perceptive. We can watch these things. We can, we can, we can have this unfold naturally. But the filmmakers are not confident you will get it. They are also, I think, uh, condescending to their audience. Which then comes in a scene where Richie and, and um, uh, this uh, her name's Mabel. Mabel. They come to the shop un- for no reason. To then talk about everything that's happening on the outside world just so Leonard can hear well, it. But that's because if they didn't have enough money, right? They could only shoot it inside the shop. So they're going to be like, man, outside. It's a in chamber the world. piece. The, what's impressive about the movie is that it chooses to be a chamber piece. I like that about the movie. It's just when you have this. Scene, have some exposition. Yeah, well, that Wasn't was the thing. Wasn't it weird that thing we just saw out of this? <sighs> they, they walk in and they start having this conversation. And I'm like, why did they come into the shop at all? She wasn't getting something. She didn't pick up. They didn't, they didn't allude bone. to that. They didn't bone. Uh, it, I don't that's think they... I, by the way, they they established she lives close to there, so they could just go to her place if that's what they're going to do. They simply wrote that scene for audience exposition. And from that point on, I was pissed off about the movie. And every <laughs> every twist was pre- prescribed. Every twist was nonsensical. Kyle's in the sequel to Drive Angry called Watch Angry. Oh, it was so aggravating. And then it got, by the last 20 or so minutes, I was just done. I was like, I don't care what happens to these characters. I hope they all die. I hope a fire starts and they're all in there and they die. And I just didn't care. I, I do think Mark Rylance is very good in it. But he is love not him, enough. Love. He's, uh, yeah, I mean, he has not been doing great work Listen, lately. The guy's got to eat, man. The I know. He's got to eat. Go back to the theater. That's where he started. He's not making as much money in the I, theater. Come true. on. Let the guy <laughs> have, let the have guy his money. Eat. That's for true. He's That's got to put food on his family. <laughs> food on the family? He's got to put food on my family. <laughs> he, and, and the best sequences in the movie are simply him. Which I, I think he must have put a lot of effort in in learning to cut cut material or at least believably or at least they yes. they integrated it nicely that it's not necessarily his hands doing it, whatever it is, uh, him narrating over the process the two hundred and twenty eight step process <laughs> of making a suit. You only and... get one the first, the second, and then the last step. So many of the steps, many of the steps, the other two hundred twenty five steps remain. Unclear. So do not Very expect unclear. to learn how to make a suit no, from this movie. No, no and but then that's, that's not happening. This is the thing. This is written by and directed by and co-written by Graham Moore. He wrote The Imitation Game. 
another film that does not trust its audience to to establish itself in that world the enigma machine but or, or also with you know kind of getting into the rhythms of that of his character and the the criminality of homosexuality during its time it's very it's very obtusely written in the imitation game and i don't really like the movie very much i think benedict cumberbatch is good this is again this is the thing i think he writes or has ideas for interesting characters this is an interesting character to me history portrayal and and what his motivation is like it, which which is kept at, at a secret it is the big the big reveal at the end is that he's been planning this the whole time that he is he's manipulated the situation he is smarter than everyone else in the room and i like that i don't i'm not against it uh, this these are the kind of films that i grew up on and i do love a good twisty narrative it's just everything was so, as soon as he told uh, Richie like early on in the movie he's like I'm the mole I'm I'm the rat I'm like yeah he is like this is so obvious and the girl's in on it unbeknownst like she doesn't they're they're doing similar things but uh, unbeknownst to each other or he knows he knows what she's doing because he's the smartest guy in the room and that's this is where it the win comes out of the sales for me is because in following the narrative or going along for the ride because you you have art art you know you have crafted this thing as if first and foremost rather than it being kind of a this thing of character and so it's artificial to me the whole narrative is artificial how everything unfolds is artificial and it's a good con job of a movie. I don't. Th- I think people could find a sense of enjoyment. I mean, if you go to Rotten Tomatoes, it's ninety percent critics. Ninety percent. Ninety percent critics. Ninety four percent. You are the ten percent. I am the ten percent. And uh, New Yorkers with me. And uh, it's usually my pre- my pretentious uh, reading material for uh, movie reviews. I mean, I, I don't know, how, do they, how do we feel about the New Yorker? Who does, like who does the reviews? Who's now? Anthony Lane and? Yeah, uh, um. This is interesting. This is, I like it when we disagree. We we agree too much, so we need to spice yes. it up. Yeah. Um, okay, so it's, it's funny, right? Because my biggest problem with the movie we had nothing to do with the story. I just thought it was shot in a way that was unnecessarily boring. Oh, oh, it, and he's a. He, this is his first film. Uh, you can tell he is. I he's mean, boring. He's I mean, a boring up filmmaker. Up to the point that, like the conversation you were talking about, where they talk about where you know Mark Rylance and, and his assistant talk about her dating this gangster it's literally shot like shot reverse shot dragnet style yeah, to the point that yeah. i noticed it and i'm i'm sort of medium sensitive to cinematic things i i honestly i'm not enough of uh of like a visual analyst of cinema to notice things unless they're particularly interesting or not obvious yeah um and generally speaking i think like good cinematography should sort of be transparent especially on a first viewing if you find yourself thinking a lot about it that's probably a mistake sure yeah. uh except in like certain limited circumstances where it's clearly trying to do something interesting yeah which may or may not work but it, yeah it could yeah. work but this was shot in a tremendously boring way like yes. the camera it's pedestrian the camera was just it was it was but it was also just there was just very rarely like it, it was so pedestrian that I noticed it. Yeah. Like, it, that's how pedestrian it was. Because even just doing simple shot, reverse shot, which is the most simple, you know, way to show a conversation, even then, you don't often see a thing where it's like, I talk and I get the camera, then you talk and you get the camera, then I talk and I get the camera. You almost always at least kind of linger on a reaction or something. Yeah. That's just Or like, move, move the camera within that small room, especially because you're confined to it. Learn from Sidney Lamette, who shot like 12 Angry Men, who shot Dog Day Afternoon, loves confined spaces and making them dynamic. Yes, yeah, Le- Learn from that. Well, Why are you doing a chamber piece if you don't know how to do it? What's sad about that is that the other visual parts of the movie were some of the things I liked the most. The costuming is great. The shop looks cool. Like it, like the the design of it is. But you don't cool. you don't actually get a full immersion in there. There's no like lingering or uh, B roll kind of it, yeah. it, status where where you get to see some of the materials. You don't get to root like 
yeah, but I still on, thought on it was. I still like, thought it was very well realized and engaging. Yeah, but you don't get you don't yeah, get not, rooted. You it's don't not get rooted. shot as well. Yes, the only parts of it that are shot in a way that is memorably good, as you say, is when it's just him doing the tailoring shop. with yeah. the voiceover. Yeah. Those scenes are definitely the most memorable and best moments. Yeah, which is telling because they're sort of peripheral to. You know, they're stylistically, I guess, thematically important, but they're somewhat peripheral to the main yeah. story. Yeah. In terms of the plot, right, which is where, where you had the biggest issues, I have a sort of different relationship to these kind of movies in that, I, you know, I am I guess I'm lazy in the mm. sense that I don't, I don't have tremendous engagement with kind of trying to figure out what's going on or figuring out if it works. Uh I understand what you're saying about the talking. I think this movie is conceiving of itself or ends up seeming unintentionally, I'm not sure which, as kind of an old-timey, talky kind of movie. Oh, There's a lot of talking. There's a lot of dialogue. Which which threw me off just a little bit because of that. Because I understood where where its influences are. It reminded me of a 1930s gangster yes, film. Yes, it's very old-fashioned. That but, It's but like he an talks early about, talkie. There's a lot of talking. He talks about James Dean. So it should set this movie if... If he leaves London, if he leaves London when James Dean and, and the the uh, he alludes to the idea of blue jeans becoming in, 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 taking on the culture and that he needed to leave England because of that, he talks about this. Is that why you wore it, blue jeans today? Yeah, so, it, well, that's, that's just what I, I wear. <laughs> it's a it, that that puts it in like at least mid nineteen fifties, and so it's this is twenty years after where I think this should have been set in. Like it's a weird movie. Yeah, but I mean, it could, I mean, the idea of doing a movie that is stylistically rooted in or an homage to like a different era of gangster movies is not in and of itself a bad idea. Uh Yeah, no. I mean, it's just the execution could have been better. Absolutely. I mean, to me, what I liked about the movie and why I think I liked it, well, I liked Rylance a lot. Yes, uh, I, I mean, he well, was... he he's he's the cool professional of this movie. Like, I I think he outacts pretty much everyone in the movie. Uh, I think notable exception, I will give Simon Russell Beale. He's all right. Uh, I, I liked him. Uh, he, he, people might know him from Death of Stalin. He's great in it, but uh, he plays Roy. He plays the head gangster of the Roy family. I like him. Uh, he's pretty good in it when, especially when the scene between them becomes menacing, where he goes, "That's my son's coat." Like you know, yeah, that that was definitely one of the better constructed scenes. Re, yeah, that's a better constructed scene. The realization of what's happening between them, how he's easing him into conversation, and then he takes him by surprise just a little bit. I I liked that scene, but like Dylan O'Brien and his terrible, terrible Chicago accent. Johnny Flynn, who I liked in the movie Beast, is a little out of his element. I mean, he's Irish, I think, and so his his American accent comes off pretty grating. I thought Zoe Deutsch was terrible. I, I, she overemphasizes words. She, I don't think she's a very good actress. And so a lot of the pieces that are essential to a chamber piece is performance and character were really underwritten for me and it, that's the problem this movie is overwritten in its context of here are my twists and turns he's plotted it out this is where i'm going to take my characters and he left the characters as these kind of empty pawn pieces for the sake of his own i don't know his sense of cleverness which i think is by half and so this movie upset me because of that mostly because I'm like this this is this is this could be entertaining for other people but this is not entertaining for me this is uh this is boring and this is uh and and, and it frustrates me because they think they're getting one over on me and I, they weren't and I it, yeah, it was I mean, frustrating it, I mean it's definitely not it's definitely not like we're not we're not in the territory of your you know your charades or your usual suspects in terms no. of like actually interesting twisting and turning. No, I mean yes, you know that he's got he's got something cooked up, and they telegraph that very early because I mean the the tell for that is that he starts lying and manipulating and it's not clear why. Yes, initially, yes. so you know okay he's up to something. Yeah, and it's going to turn out that and he's, he's and he's, he's kind of and he's making up different lies in different moments 
for the sake of different people where one person knows they're lying and they're like i don't know why but he's able to get away with that lie because the other person doesn't want can't necessarily i get the construction and some of it works most of it doesn't but that's why the coat sequence is is good the yes. scene you brought up i like that two, scene because that's the two best performers that scene has legitimate surprise and suspense and that's also the moment where it goes from him lying like he he loses control in that moment like up until then he's sort of in control of the way it's all playing yes. out or at least it's playing out uh sufficiently, sufficiently. To, his, yeah. to his liking and that's where he actually gets some real threat yeah right and and starts to having to improvise right yeah so um yeah i mean you had a lot stronger response to this movie than i do i i found it enjoyable enough um i liked rylance a lot yeah he yeah. gets he even gets kind of demonic near the end of the movie which is kind of cool <laughs> yeah it's a little uh, interesting uh, he he does a good job uh like i said i i i think i liked the art design the the, the production design aspects of it more than you I, did i wanted just more of it if you if you're gonna set us into one place i want to really yeah feel yeah it. yeah but that's to me a lot of that goes back to the the specific way it's shot which is just in such a paint by numbers yes. kind of way yeah no that that is the main problem yeah i mean they really and, and and so like i said it's it's shot and it's written dialogue wise in a way that is very kind of nostalgic like you said more for like the movies of the 30s you're right like old school talkies like i said that ping pong camera thing that's just dragnet right yeah and that's yeah. just like just like hey what are we? Da, 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 but da, da. like back, that, back, and, that, back. and that's the thing it's like the 30s were far more inventive like uh, i'd say what you uh, i know a lot of people are like oh 30s black and white these guys were exceptional on how they move the camera in one space i mean ernst lubish mastered this i mean he would he uh, most of his films were set in like one location and the camera would fluidly move his oh, editing yeah. dyna is yeah, dynamic but I mean, that, yes but we're, and so uh, the, the, nobody's, gonna, nobody's gonna call this a classic no i not... know i i'm just saying if you're gonna pay homage like do it right do it right well like it's well first of all you you have to but you also have to do it a little different right i mean i guess it's different that it's not as good but it, it is uh, I see what they were trying to do there. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I also thought, I also thought like the rhythm of the movie was good in the sense that it, I liked the oscillations between kind of different moods. Like I understand um, the scene where he's the mole. Yeah. What, what he's saying is kind of like, oh, okay, of course we see where this is going. But I thought that the movie did a good job kind of like of having those more ingratiating quiet moments. Like the levels of it were good. I thought that worked well. Yeah. Uh, um, and like I said, it's it, a lot of that is Rylance too. But yeah, I mean, this movie is definitely not any hill that I would die on. Sure. Uh, it's it's not it's not particularly great, but I found it to be entertaining enough for what it was, and it does. And it's at least it's not too long. Which yeah, is another sin that the, the, that's we, we true. It was actually first. quite short, so my frustrations were were limited in in time span. We don't have much more time, only because we're on a tight schedule today. But I wanted to we'll follow up with one question because we we see these movies essentially for a a flat price. We we have AMC stubs. I'm sure you saw it in AMC, and it's yeah. part it's part of your okay. plan. You're, we're yeah. able to. See, if you had paid for this movie yeah i wouldn't i would pay if you're gonna if you have to shell if you have to reach into your pocket for more money i would see x oh, i would probably yeah. i would pull out money for x yeah. i don't know that i would for that fit I, I i definitely think you could also i think that the theater experience is more interesting in x like, like yes. I, said, I think you actually get yeah. something out of seeing it in a theater I, I i was surprised how surprised people in my audience in the outfit were but by some things i was like really like you didn't yeah there were i, I can't remember what but there were a few like audible gasps and i was like oh, yeah, okay yeah, okay so but I, I i think that just on the strength uh also it was in chicago so maybe i'm a little sympathetic for that but on the strength of you know like a decently twisty pop plot um that i agree is marred by a few scenes that are kind of yeah what well, what's this is like the classic example of the scene you don't write where it's two people having a conversation that they would never have for some no, sort of exp it's, exposition it's, it's reason. It's so aggravating. Uh, but on the strength of, you know, 
I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't particularly have such a negative response to the performance as you did, and we both like Rylance. I think as a streaming home watch option, you know, okay, you might enjoy it. That's fair. Well, we should wrap up. Um, uh, thanks for joining us this week. Uh, we'll we'll be back next week. We got. Uh, I think we're gonna do the Lost City, and everything, everywhere. All at once, which Ooh. I'm super excited. Ooh, about. I hope it doesn't suck. If it I, sucks, yes, we're gonna be me sad. Too. We're going to be super that's sad. sad. Well, yeah, yeah, that. And then uh, Northman coming up. That might be yeah. the next. I saw the trailer for that for the first time. Oh, that outfit. So it's that was great. It's a great trailer. Great that's, trailer. I'm in. Yeah, I'm in. I'm sold. Um, ben Robert Thayer. Eggers, don't, don't let me down. Yeah. Don't if you let do, me down. I'm going to cry on camera. Yeah. Oh, no. I'm going to cry right here. <laughs> I'm gonna well, cry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna don't re- let Ben Thalen cry. That don't would be it. no. But uh, Dead Reckoner podcast. Uh, yeah, you can find right. him. Uh, do we do pods? We do stuff. Absolutely. Um, I'm Kyle Brule. I know movies and you don't. And uh, we'll see you next time.